Welcome to Applied Innovation. Okay, so hi and welcome to, to uh, go live from San Francisco, Capgemini Applied Innovation Exchange. Um, my name is Andreas and I will be your host today. Um, first, um, I hope you are all safe where you are. I'm glad that so many of you could join. In fact, uh, we have attendees uh, from the West Coast, from the East Coast and, and Europe, and we have even attendees from India. So I'm really happy to see all of you joining. Um, this event is uh, the first of three events uh, on the topic of uh, the future of work. Um, the future of work is evolving faster than, than ever before, um, right before our eyes, obviously. Um, across all sectors, uh, all over the world, uh, organizations are exploring where we work and, and how we work. Um, some have already announced that there is no way turning back to our previous ways of working. Um, maybe you noticed yesterday, um, or you saw yesterday, Twitter's CEO, Jack Dorsey, uh, informing his employees that uh, they can they can continue working from home forever. Um, and the list is long. Uh, JP Morgan, Facebook, Capital One, Amazon, Microsoft, many others have announced that they are extending their work from home policies. Now, there are many aspects to this. Um, obviously, technology through providing collaboration platforms and software technology plays a part, obviously. However, there are many, many more aspects of future of work that is incredibly relevant. Um, how do you manage business operations? Um, how, how do you shape leadership in an organization? Uh, upskilling challenges and opportunities, um, and maybe perhaps even psychological aspects of working from home. So that's why we, we decided to uh, focus on this topic in a three-part event series. And I am proud to be joined by two thought leaders, successful CEOs from the Bay Area, Deidre Paknad, co-founder and CEO from Workboard, and Gabe Salporto, CEO Udacity. Welcome. Thank you. Good, good, good to see you, Gabe, and, and good to see you, Deidre. I think you're on mute, Deidre. Um, so just let me introduce you real quick and um, and then we'll get started in this conversation because I think we have a lot of ground to cover together. So Didri uh, is a serial entrepreneur, uh, has founded and led several companies, including Workboard. Um, her last company, PSS Systems, created a new market category and inspired deep customer loyalty from global 1000 companies. You have 16 patents, Didri, and published dozens of articles. Welcome, Didri. Thank you. Nice to be here. Nice to have you. And Gabe Dalporto is the CEO at Udacity. And uh, prior, prior to joining Udacity, he worked at LendingTree as chief marketing officer and uh, also chief financial officer. Um, Gabe continues to be an active board member there. Um, and he is also a board member of Guitar Center, which is kind of an interesting mix. I want to hear something about that, actually. That's going to be interesting. Welcome, Gabe. You have a bachelor's degree in nuclear en uh, engineering from the University of Florida and a master's degree in nuclear engineering from MIT. Proud to have you, Gabe. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves and what comes to mind at first uh, when you look at the current uh, market situations? Gabe or Deidre, uh, <laughs> however you want to go first. Um, sure, I, I can jump in. Um, you know, look, I am, uh, I have a little bit of a weird background. You know, the nuclear engineering CFO, CMO <laughs> background is, is pretty atypical. Um, but I think it, it will become, you know, much more typical in the world we live in today. Uh, even prior to COVID, uh, the world is moving very rapidly into a data-driven world. Um, nuclear engineering gave me like a very strong foundation in just analytics and problem solving, a structured approach to problems. Mm. Um, 
I, uh, I moved into, uh, personally into marketing, uh, as a big career shift. Um, but, you know, thankfully actually, you know, my mentors there were, um, you know, X capital one and, you know, learned that just the rigorous test and learn direct marketing, you know, data driven, uh, marketing approach and kind of grew my career into, you know, CMO of lending tree, where we, you know, we were probably, you know, um, spending $300 million a year in marketing, 90% of that online digital, uh, you know, direct response marketing mm -hmm. uh, made the transition into the uh, the CFO role um, uh, when the CEO of Lending Tree called me one Friday night and said, "Hey, I'm firing my CFO. Do you want to be the CFO?" And I, after you know, you know, an expletive of what the blank are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I said, "That's kind of interesting. Tell me more." And uh, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of that lifelong learner. I love challenges, and uh, mm -hmm. and he was looking for someone in the finance seat who could be a strategic CFO and drive the business from you know, that, that finance or that, uh, that kind of business perspective and build out world-class analytics that would really drive decision-making throughout the organization. And, mm -hmm. you know, after, you know, after, so let's say a stressful six months learning how to, uh, how to be a finance head, um, you know, I think I kind of got into a groove and, and stretched myself and learned new skills. And, um, and we were able to take lending tree from a $5 stock to a $351 stock and the number three return on the NASDAQ. So, um, the, the whole kind of nature of work, uh, I think in a macro sense has changed certainly over my career. Uh, I think the skill sets that, you know, make you successful are really just that critical, you know, thinking skills and the ability to mm -hmm. take on new challenges and to upskill yourself and to learn. And, um, and now more than ever in the history of the world, there's, you know, there's great ways to, uh, to do that in a structured way. Yeah. And that's interesting. I think with with that background, I think obviously in the context of future work, it's going to be really interesting to to hearing also from from the point of view of Udacity and 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 what you're seeing. So thank you for 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 joining us. And Deidre, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, it's kind of a long story as you can see, but uh, to shortcut it, I um, early early in my uh, career uh, on a summer job on a break from law school, I found a really thorny operational and process problem that was uh, causing a lot of destruction at the semiconductor company I was working at. Hmm. And it was a really expensive problem. It was very, uh, basically we were communicating instructions in the wrong way, which was leading to a ruined product, which meant we hit the cost and couldn't satisfy the customer. And I had this idea about how to apply this uh, technology because I just spent uh, my entire student loan on a Mac at the time. <laughs> and I had this idea of like, we you know if we did this digitally, then we could do this more precisely. And if we did it more precisely, we would waste less and we'd have better customer set. And right. so I, 22 years old, wrote my first proposal. Boss said, great, let's do it. That's yours now. Go buy nine. These people work for you. Make it happen. And then after that, I was on the customer tour and I realized, oh, this problem solving stuff is pretty mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. And so literally the whole career that sort of follows that same thread processes that are broken, expensive, risky, underserve the customer. How do we take those and mm -hmm. automate them, streamline them, make them more reliable, more digital, more transparent. And that fast forward several companies later um, and a, a stint being an executive uh, at IBM for a while, the mm. process that I'm so focused on right now, which honestly couldn't be more important is this process by which we align on the mission of the organization. Right. We align on the strategic priorities. We mobilize our workforce around that and we measure our progress. That right. process is grossly broken, incredibly right. ad hoc and manual in most companies. And that's where I'm, tackling now yeah and i i think from the perspective of future or work obviously in this current situation which is you know has many businesses and organizations all over the world under immense pressure i think these these aspects are are uh, even more critical relevant and um, in, in in our engaging with customers we see that also that you know what was true before COVID-19 and, and, and the current pressure uh, is even truer today in, in, in many ways, right? So what you're saying, I, I, I fully understand and, 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 uh, and, and see also. So, I mean, from a overall perspective, uh, when I reached out to you, Didri and, and, and Gabe, 
uh, asking you to join me for a conversation on future work. Uh, uh, what what went through your mind? I mean, what comes to your mind when you think about the future or work just, just from an overall perspective? We have many topics to deep dive into in this session or this event, but if you just go from an overview perspective. I think one of the, first, I love the topic, right? Uh, half of that future is here now and the other we haven't imagined yet. But I think the biggest um, opportunity and biggest challenge is uh, what we replace proximity with. Mm -hmm. I think most organizations and certainly knowledge driven organizations relied on proximity to give direction and to do inspection mm -hmm. and create connection. Mm -hmm. And without proximity, what fills its place? What voids are left? Right. And how do we fill those voids? So mm -hmm. if you relied on being in the same room with people or on the same campus to guide them forward, now mm -hmm. what? If you relied on being in the same campus to build relationships, skip level, yeah. now what? And I think the void will be where the innovation rises, and that mm -hmm. void will be how much we relied on being near each other to right. move our organizations forward. We've yeah. got to replace that, I think, with novel ways of connecting, novel ways of leading, and I think we have to replace that void with data we can all access on our own mm -hmm. and in the moment rather than in the meeting and on the campus. Right, right. So those are three key topics, I think. The collaborating aspect, the leading aspect, and, and the whole kind of decision, data-driven decision-making aspect of all of that. Uh, Gabe, what do you make of those aspects? Well, yes, and, and I, I agree with all of that, in particular you know, on the third aspect, the data-driven um, decision-making. Um, I will rewind back to early in my career uh, when I moved into the marketing world. You know, at the time, you know, the vast majority of marketing spend was spent in, you know, the offline world, things like TV and print and radio and direct mail, um, out of home. Um, mm -hmm. And all that's pretty hard to attribute, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so you kind of did your best, but, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of qualitative um, analysis that went into it. And I kind of joke, like, I kind of wish I spent my marketing career marketing soap or something that was really hard to track and not accountable. And I could just, you know, enjoy drawing pretty pictures. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, sadly, or fortunately, I, I got into direct marketing, which was measurable and then digital marketing very early on. And now, you know, a huge percentage of spend today is digital is, um, is tracked extremely well and you know we can spend hours talking about attribution modeling and things like that but mm. you know, by and large you, you you are you are living in a marketing world that is very very uh data driven um decision making is is driven off of fact and test and learn and structured analyses and predictive models and all kinds of interesting stuff and audience segmentation and so that data driven decision making um, is is expanding and permeating every other function of the organization today, right. and, um, and and really it becomes like the cornerstone skill of the future uh, is really just having that critical thinking, uh, data driven decision making, um, data analysis skill set. Right. Yeah. So uh, going back to you, Deidre, and Workboard and and. Um, why I think Workboard is such an interesting company in this context. Uh, I think the per perspective of managing a business operations, right, um, means so many different things, right? It means always, or well, having always informed executives, obviously, but also connecting back to, to enabling the organization to act on real time, uh, data driven kind of decision making, right? Um, also, from a communication perspective, across the organization and, and outside, um, you know, getting to easy to understand and easy to act on reporting, um, I think it takes um, uh, a lot of efforts out of the equation when you can focus on, on, on issues and risks, so to speak, rather than data gathering and presentation, and that's kind of very relevant, I think, in current pressure or in the current situation. So uh, why don't you go ahead and, 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 and take some time to 
to share with us the you know your your perspective on that and 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 what workboard has in in um, in your portfolio and your ideas and thinking to address uh, those opportunities uh, you know please go ahead and you, I, you know you can also share your screen if you have any slides you want to show so please do go ahead yep no i'd love to do that i think you probably need to give me permission to share yes so i'll i'll hand that over to you yeah, you have the keys to the kingdom okay, so now you are the presenter <laughs> terrific thank you Okay, I'll just make sure that you do actually see my screen. Yeah, we see your screen. Perfect. So the operational management is, is quite right and an apt label for how we help organizations. Uh, you can see we work with some of the largest and certainly some of the fastest growing tech companies in the world. And what we help them with, what we provide is a, what we think of as a results platform, which is, uh, what direction are we headed? Like, where are we going? And how do we know we're going to get there, right? And where we are now. So uh, define, align, measure, and manage to a set of business results and outcomes more pervasively through the organization. And in addition to that platform, we do a lot of what we call coaching, which is helping leadership teams be clear and articulate in the mission and how they communicate that to their organization so that it, in fact, mobilizes and motivates people. So that's not just numbers, that's purpose, plus the numbers. And then below the leadership team, helping people build the kind of skill of getting clear on both the direction and the data that they're going to drive to. And mm -hmm. so that's building alignment muscle, being able to quantify results, building uh, skill sets, competencies, really, in how to measure progress towards an outcome. Mm -hmm. A bunch of those customers had, because they already had an ability to align quickly on strategic priorities, mobilize their organization and measure their progress, going into March 2020, they already had the muscle and the capacity to quickly shift, mm -hmm. right? And, I, and that set them up quite well to respond to super disruptive events. And that's the definition of resilience, really. And it's going to set them up to ride the bumps and the waves over the rest of this year and into 2020 as well, where, or 2021, where there will clearly be bumps and waves as we go forward. They, and many of our customers, and I, I think most uh, C-suite executives right now who have the potential, look at this as not just a crisis, but a catalyst, right? A catalyst to accelerate the digital transformation, a catalyst to really truly realize those things that were in the back of their mind as important and maybe we should now we must and the way we think about the the new essentials are clearly companies need to shift strategic priorities fast and frequently and mm -hmm. mobilize everybody around those we thought that was nice 90 days ago we know from 60 days ago it's an absolute essential ingredient and not only do they need to shift those strategic priorities, but people need a source of truth on what those strategic priorities are at the org level, in their function, their marketing or dev, and even at the group level. That's the most fundamental truth. What are we trying to achieve here? Mm. Maybe I don't want to interrupt you here in this flow, but I think yeah, this is you know, from my experience now also uh, from a Capgemini perspective and working with clients now, this is so, so true uh, when we are all working from home or from remote lo locations, right? And and we don't get that, you know, those in-between moments where we can share, you know, share messages that are, you know, are around these topics, like, you know, what are the, you know, our priorities and how do we express this or that, you know, it's, those moments are lost. So obviously we have to ask ourselves, how can we make up for that? And how can we address, you know, that necessity in the organization? So this is incredibly important. We have to move past implied alignment to self-serve on demand. I can see where we're going and I know how I contribute. Mm -hmm. But I think when you think then about teams, right? Teams need the members of the team to be able to work independently from their home, but also cohesively mm. so that they can be productive apart, 
not just productive when they're co-located and co-housed in an organization. And those three things, companies, people, and teams needs, they put a new imperative, I think, on information. It needs to be automated, accessible, and we need it faster. Mm -hmm. In other words, for companies to deliver results and to have the maximum resilience, we all need to be able to move forward in the moment, not in the meeting, but in the moment from our individual houses, but we need to be able to move forward in a cohesive way. And that's really sitting on a foundation of data. That data in, in our mind is the direction, the strategic priorities, and the contributions each of us are making. So we work cohesively, but also autonomously. Right. It's when I when you go back just uh, to the slide you had before and the image to the left, I think that's uh, that's not a random image, right? Uh, no, no. I'd love I, I to think, show you. <laughs> yeah, I, I I hope we get to see a little bit more of that. But but I, I can tell uh, just you know, by looking at it, it looks to be a very easy to understand uh, dashboard of objectives and how objectives are being met, and just giving that quick overview of how things are progressing. I think you know that kind of information that I need to get really quickly at a glance to make a decision or to understand what's happening just this moment, right? So I use the next hour in the smartest way, right? But I think that where we kind of come into this with Workboard in particular, right, is help organizations build the process of aligning on strategic priorities more quickly, mobilizing the teams, driving focus. And we do that with a platform that is okay, our alignment and results dashboarding, which is one of the things you just saw, smarter meeting agenda, you put the results on the agenda without asking somebody to prepare a 60 point power or 60 page PowerPoint slide deck, right? right. And coordinate work more autonomously. Let me give you a quick look at that, um, that heat map in particular. So oh, wow. what- I didn't know actually, but uh, before you go uh, on in there, I just want to remind everyone on the call and, and, and all of you attendees, uh, 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 please do use the Q&A feature in WebEx events and the WebEx meeting app here, and we'll pick that up and, and, and discuss around also your questions. So feel free to do that. Divri, please go ahead. So the, the heat map is a view of all of the teams in the organization. And the red, yellow, green is uh, the risk of their achieving what they set out to in the quarter. And it's mathematics, right? It's not an opinion that I'm doing great or an opinion that we're at risk, but it's really the math on it. My current course and speed, given the time remaining in the quarter, I'm not going to make my objectives and the results we set out. And what you see right away as a leader is in one blink, you knew there were six teams that needed some help and attention. You didn't have to look at 60 or 600 or 6,000 teams to find the issue. In a blink, you knew that. And I mean, more importantly, in a single click, you get straight to the facts. So what were the objectives this team was trying to achieve? They're trying to reach the right buyers. They were trying to develop a cutting edge roadmap. And how were they defining success? What were they measuring? What is the risk? You get really quite literally to what it is they're trying to accomplish, the metrics for success they set out for themselves, the key results, both their plan and their actual, and you can jump more deeply into it. For a lot of organizations, pre-COVID, this would have taken three weeks mm. to figure out who needed help and to get the data around it. And this is just radical transparency with purposefulness behind it. And then every team in the organization can see across lateral alignment, not vertical alignment, old school hierarchical way, but lateral alignment is how we drive higher value to company and to customers. And that requires lateral transparency we haven't usually enjoyed. And I think is more imperative now than ever, but it's a simple scroll to see what each team is trying to achieve, how they're doing against those things we're trying to accomplish. And then just the ability to interrogate that quite quickly mm -hmm. and see what does focus mean? When we say drive extraordinary value to customers, how do we know we're doing that? What are the measures we, we think are important to our success? And then, well, I want to see why we're not, or why we're in the red on that particular measure, and I can jump straight to it. And the charts and graphs are drawn for me. I didn't actually have to ask one of my really smart team members to spend a week's time putting together a deck. 
and I have the, the data, the facts in an instant, right? This transparency and connectivity to me is essential to helping our organizations move forward to their best results, even as we do all that from our individual homes and in much, much higher isolation individually, we still can be cohesive organizationally. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, things that when I, I talked a little bit about information and being accelerated with Workboard, we both define the objectives we're trying to achieve and how those align through the organization, what each team is driving and contributing towards. And in addition to that alignment, we, we think about accelerating the accountability for those outcomes as well. And so Workboard has what we think of as automation for the monthly business reviews and the quarterly business reviews and the ops reviews so that those things are also readily accessible, continuously available on demand, and they reflect the real facts and data about our business. And so instead of needing to find the PowerPoint deck, right. we all have access to, among other things, the narrative teams want to share, and the data is the data. It's continuously updated. I don't need to update the deck. I don't need to redo the slides. I don't need to scavenger hunt to pull it together. It's always here and it's flowing in real time. So I have what I think of as sort of the perfect combination, the narrative, the texture, and right. the facts and the data to move right. forward. So, so a couple of questions uh, with regards to this. Um, first, uh, if I'm, as an organization, I'm interested to get started in actually implementing this kind of platform and a management system, so to speak, what are the first few steps that are really important that I need to address? So that's the first question. And the second question is, in your view, as you worked with organizations that have actually taken this on, right, and use, uh, what is like the evolution of maturity in actually using the KPIs and managing the business? With it? I assume you have like a starting phase and then you actually grow wiser because you find new you know, correlations between KPIs and all of that. So, so what's kind of that evolution look like? So those two questions, how do you get started and what's the evolution, that kind of thing? Yeah, the, uh, a couple of things. So of course we provide the platform, but for most organizations, they also need some process help, right? Yeah. They don't currently know how to have a really tight, smart quarterly iteration on objectives and key results. And they're not very good at setting OKRs below the leader level. And they could spend an entire year still not being very good at it. And so part of our process coaching is to help them get it right the first time mm -hmm. and to get better results in the first quarter. We have that it's very structured methodology and approach to help launch a program. So at uh, Workday as an example, and actually similar in all these organizations, in you think about it as waves of alignment of deeper alignment. So in a first quarter, you might take, you know, the first three layers of the organization and one full part of it and align objectives and key results to that. And then in the second quarter, broaden it out to the whole organization. So enter for a lot of our customers, they, what would have taken them three quarters last year has now taken them one quarter this year. So enterprise wide in the first quarter, because really everybody does need to be able to see what it is we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Everybody does need to have on demand access to that. And so our coaching can help you go quite quickly, right? And create access and visibility for everybody quickly. The second thing I would say is use the natural quarter inflection point, right? So most organizations, the leader level, reset some targets for the quarter mm. it presents a really perfect moment and if so if your quarter starts july 1 now is the moment to think about well how do we mobilize the organization on what it is we want to accomplish in q3 we need to be tighter here sharper there faster here mm. it is the right time now to think about how do you maximize your impact in q3 right Right, right. Well, that, that's 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 uh, really relevant and, and really interesting. I think it also speaks, obviously, to to what you know what what needs to kind of be beneath all of this is this uh, 
um, these data proficiencies in the organization, right? In order for you actually to be able to consolidate and show anything, you need to have those in place in the uh, organization and, and learn how to, you know, to to use it. I don't know that you have to have a lot of data infrastructure, to be honest. What's missing, mm -hmm. the gap that's, fill, that's filled here is not 10 million operating data points. It's right. not that. The thing that's missing for most organization is what's the plan? Right. What system do we keep plan in? Where do I go at what it is we're trying to achieve? Right. That void is giant. Mm -hmm. That void is expensive, right? And when yeah. you think about board dropping into that void, it's the process is actually agreeing on what we're trying to achieve, what the plan is at the top and through the organization and how it aligns. Right. It's agreeing on that and capturing it in a system, a source of truth that everyone can go see. Mm. It's uh, then if we actually know what it is we're trying to accomplish, right? We yeah. can actually prioritize where we spend our time this week. I understand. We start so Monday, so uh, at those objectives. I use I Tuesday smartly. Yeah. So, so um, from that perspective, meaning so focusing on what what we have to or need to achieve, and what the plan is, and 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 uh, how to manage operations according to those kind of objectives, um, in in the current situation uh, in the market, uh, COVID nineteen and the pressure and all of that, have you seen any any new nuances of objective setting or or managing operations? Is there anything that that is different? Two things are different. One is um, the tone change on the objectives at the top, right? And it's the it's a language shift from accelerate to earn, right? The uh, the shift is a, a tone aware of what customers and employees need, which has changed, right? Mm -hmm. And so we we saw that a lot from a good number of our customers, probably thirty five or forty percent. All of the objectives of the leadership team changed mm. in March and April, mm. and the the others they they shifted tone, but didn't meaningfully change. Yeah, understand. And we have companies that are providing Cisco WebEx, for example, obviously their business is expanding rapidly. Microsoft, which is also expanding, rapidly. Comcast, right. which is serving us all Xfinity and Internet, right? The right. dynamics in their world of responding fast are right. different than they are in other organizations where it's more of a continuity of where they were as opposed mm -hmm. to a mobilization. Mm -hmm. So tone change in the objectives. The second mm -hmm. thing that's changed is a huge acceleration in just how fast we want to provide people with digital ways of understanding priorities of connecting and of collaborating. Mm -hmm. So the, where the traditional enterprise thinking might have been, we have to go slow, People can't learn another tool tomorrow. The shift is actually we need to go fast. So we want to give 10,000 people access to work board in 20 days. Right, right. Right, I because understand. we're not willing yeah, to yeah. go to a quarter where nobody right. knows what to focus on. Yeah, right. yeah. Gabe, uh, I think this resonates also really well with uh, what you also already shared, your perspectives and, and uh, what do you take out of this kind of from a management perspective and and the objective setting and and the the aspect of tone and tonality um yeah look i can i can speak from our our specific situation which is um we were we were looking for a framework to drive you know our initiatives through the organization um and it when it became apparent you know, at the end of February, that COVID was going to hit and it was going to hit, you know, pretty materially. It was going to affect our business that we didn't know how it was going to affect our business. Um, we literally adopted OKRs overnight and <laughs> currently we're running that process off of Google Sheets. So, um, uh, I, 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 <laughs> I need really some matchmaking here now, Gabe. So please meet the. <laughs> I, I already uh, uh, texted my operations team saying, hey, check out Workboard. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, but no, I mean, and, and it's been extremely effective, uh, an effective way. OPRs have been a very effective way to drive alignment through the organization, uh, to focus on like, what is 
critical for this quarter so that we can successfully navigate the COVID crisis. So, um, and, and frankly, like the employees were, um, you know, super, super happy about the clarity that was provided. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love the OKR framework. Um, you know, the thing that we are personally struggling with is just how do you, how do you um, operationalize it? And, uh, and so I think this, you know, obviously a great platform to do that. Um, and, and just the, the total clarity and the total alignment and the focus you get from that quarterly planning cadence. And now we're, as you say, Deidre, we're right now moving into our Q3 OKR development and uh, it forces really good, hard conversations on like strategically where we put our resources, our people. Um, you know, we thought going into COVID, this might be, you know, negative for our business. Turns out like we're, it's actually quite positive for our business. Um, and so we have to go from a, like a, a stance of like hiring freeze and maintaining cash to like, now where are we going to invest? And so it's, right. it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting to see the dynamic change. Um, but it, it totally resonates with us. Yeah. So when it comes to, to, to that, I think it's really interesting what, what history has taught us. I think is that with every, every wave of disruption in whatever form it comes, um, uh, comes along with it the need to to upskill or to learn new things and to kind of adapt to a new environment and and um, I think that's super critical obviously not just for the individual right but for the entire organization and even the market even the entire economy I think um, so that's why I'm also really interested and 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 um, excited to hear about the new developments over at Udacity because I, as I followed you for some time, uh, I, I, I obviously, um, you know, noticed the AI for healthcare nano degree program you launched the other day, right? And uh, also the recent collaborative efforts with Intel and AWS on edge AI, IoT, machine learning, uh, you know, new aspects or new, new aspects to these topics, right, which are, you know, going to be even more relevant moving forward and into the future. So, uh, Gay, why don't you walk us through um, some of the uh, um, thoughts and processes and what's going on over at Udacity? Fantastic. And um, have you shared the presenter? Oh, absolutely. There you go. Now you're the presenter. Thank you. Okay, let's see if this works. And the, um, thank you, Deirdre, for your presentation and, and uh, appreciate it very much. Okay. Um, just help me understand where I, I did oh, the, oh, this forward button. Got it. Okay. Give me one second. Sure. Can you guys see my Chrome? Um, yes. Okay. Let me click on that. Awesome. Thank you. Well, uh, Deirdre did a great job talking about how we can, from an organization, um, organize our work and drive, uh, you know, initiatives throughout the organization so that everybody can, uh, in this new world, work remotely, uh, which I think is fantastic. And Udacity is all about making sure we have the right skill sets to deliver on those initiatives, right? And the outlook on January 1st, and I say January 1st because everything has changed and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the outlook on January 1st was already pretty disruptive, which is World Economic Forum predicted 800 million jobs will be lost due to AI machine learning and automation by 2030. Uh, an additional 375 million will need to change the nature of their jobs over the next 10 years. Mm. Um, $1.4 trillion uh, will be spent on digital transformation. Um, and that's a 17% CAGR over the next five years. Um, and talent shortage is ranked the number one risk to organizational change, right? So it's already a pretty bleak picture. And if I want to, and I, I want to kind of connect this, you know, to the, the human and personal level, right? So what happens when 800 million jobs are, are, are lost or the nature of jobs are, are changed or transformed? You know, I grew up in, in West Virginia, rural West Virginia, and, you know, I was growing up and, you know, I'm a little bit old. So like in the seventies and eighties in West Virginia, um, the economy was pretty strong. It was pretty vibrant. You know, it was a lot, a lot of uh, income to the state from coal. You know, people could earn, you know, good middle class lifestyles. I uh, had vibrant downtowns. Um, you know, through the late 80s and the 90s and 2000s, that entire industry automated. And, and I've personally seen what happens to a state and to people I know um, when they don't reskill on the jobs of the future. And so, 
in the downtown areas now when I go back or boarded up, the country clubs are shut down uh, and people to the extent they have jobs are working in, you know, minimum wage service industry jobs working at Walmart or, or, or things like that. And um, so to me, it's quite real. And if you think you've seen societal unrest today, like you haven't seen anything when a billion people have their jobs ripped out from under them. And it's not just going to be um, in Appalachia and the Rust Belt, it's going to be across the globe. And it's not going to just be blue collar jobs, it's gonna be white collar jobs. AI can read cancer off an x-ray better than a doctor can now. So the nature of every job is, is about to change. Uh, we ran in Q1, uh, right before COVID, a, uh, a survey among our enterprise clients. And 83% um, uh, said they had a troubling skills gap. 70% of them said talent shortage is preventing innovation in their organization. Um, top can't fill roles were really broadly speaking, um, the, the top two categories were data analytics and cloud. And uh, that broke down 46% said AI machine learning was a can't fill strategic role. 45% mm. cloud, and the next two are also data, right? So 42% data science and 40% digital analytics. And it's getting worse. Projections from World Economic Forum, our demand for these categories uh, will grow 50% plus over the next two years, right? So organizations need to uh, set their strategic ob objectives. They need to drive automation. They need to drive innovation. Um, they can't, right? They just don't have the skill sets to do that. And 52% uh, ranked reskilling and upskilling uh, in emerging technologies as a top priority. So that was all pre-COVID. What has happened since COVID? Um, it's basically accelerated that trend by five to 10 years. And over the last uh, six weeks or so, we've seen 37 million people in the United States alone uh, file first time claims for unemployment due to COVID-19. Um, depending on how you count it, we're approaching 20% unemployment rate, not seen since the Great Depression. Uh, and I think, you know, frankly, my opinion is the hopes of a V-shaped recovery, I think, are wildly optimistic. Uh, many companies are going bankrupt. Those jobs are not coming back. Many eliminated positions will be automated. Um, it is accelerating digital transformation among large companies and, and uh, large enterprises. Um, it becomes just that much more critical to to move online. I had a conversation with, you know, one of the top three banks in the world uh, earlier this week, and they said they saw a bigger, more dramatic shift to automated systems in the last um, five weeks than they've seen in the last several years combined, right? And so things are accelerating, even for for very large enterprises that you know traditionally have moved relatively slowly. Uh, and for many, the jobs of the past are gone, right? And so then you say, what do you do about this? And my answer is without massive retraining, we're facing large structural uh, unemployment. And this is not just the responsibility of governments, it's the responsibility of, of enterprises to, to reskill themselves. And it's not just uh, blue collar, as I mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of the processes and one of the jobs that are shrinking pretty quickly is kind of low level accounting work. Um, you know, pilots, I mean, planes flying themselves pretty much right now, journalists, lawyers, doctors, everybody's going to be affected. Not everybody's going to be totally disrupted, but everybody's going to be disrupted to some extent. And the skill sets that got you here are not the skill sets that are going to get you where you want to go. So the challenge with dealing with um, societal unemployment at this level is if you tried to reskill a billion people on the university system, you would literally break the university system and bankrupt the world. And by the way, a substantial portion of them would graduate with like journalism degrees that there's no jobs for anyway. Um, Udacity helped create an entire category of online learning called MOOCs about a decade ago. And um, we're no longer a MOOC. Uh, we're something quite different now. Uh, and the great thing about MOOCs was they took university content and made it, uh, you know, videotape professors made it free or cheap online. And then you could be sitting in Argentina watching a University of Michigan or Stanford professor talk about something interesting. The challenge with the MOOC model is it's very shallow. And so you don't learn karate by watching Bruce Lee movies, right? And so I don't learn to be a machine learning engineer by watching a few videos. Uh, I learn it by actually doing it. And so that's where Udacity kind of has a, you know, I could 
have to give my predecessors uh, uh, total credit, Sebastian, the founder of the company. Um, they came up with it, just a better model and a different model, right? And so uh, we really start with a resume, an employable job resume. Like if I want to be a machine learning engineer or a self-driving car engineer, like I must have actually done these four things, not like read about it or watched videos, but actually done it. And we start with uh, the curriculum, which is we go out into industry and we partner with people like Google and Amazon and Facebook and Intel, as you mentioned, um, leaders in technology and innovation, and uh, and we co-create content. And so instead of like an hour long university lecture, you're gonna see a four to five minute video from an industry expert in industry context, followed by hands-on key, uh, keys coding, reinforcement learning, four to five minutes, hands-on keys coding, all asynchronous. So you can do it at 2 a.m. in the morning or you know 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, then uh, if you have questions, uh, we have mentors. So if I, if I get stuck, I can ask a question. I'll get an answer in less than an hour. Um, and when I uh, submit like a detailed project, I get code reviews, detailed line by line code reviews in, in like two to three hours. Um, mm. And the, the, the crown jewels of this whole thing is really our project based learning. And so this is where instead of like, you know, watching a video lecture and, and taking a quiz, uh, the cornerstone of this is uh, deep immersive project. So in a typical, what we call a nano degree, uh, which is call it 10 hours a week, uh, three to six months on your own time. Um, you'll have call it four to six deep immersive projects. And what you're seeing here is real, right? This is our self-driving car engineer course where your capstone pro project, like you upload your code into our self-driving car. And it drives around our parking lot and it stops in red, it goes in green, it doesn't hit stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is a level of like practitioner level, hands-on training, hands-on skills uh, we deliver on our project. Other examples would be uh, we just launched AI in healthcare and uh, students teach AI how to recognize pneumonia in x-rays. Mm -hmm. Right. So they can now go into healthcare and say, look, I've done this. Now I can teach it how to do something you know, similar or different. So that's the, uh, that's the, the, the platform itself. You know, the story of the company is super interesting. Sebastian there on the left, um, you know, he went to Stanford back in 2011. And uh, well, first of all, he more or less invented the modern self-driving car. He founded Waymo at Google, founded Google X at Google. And then in 2011 was teaching uh, an AI course at Stanford. Um, and he went to Stanford and said, hey, I want to put this online. And Stanford said, no way, we don't want you to do that. And he's like, well, I'm just going to do it anyway. So he put it online. Um, he got 160,000 enrollees in the first week before Stanford made him stop taking new enrollees. Um, 23,000 people graduated the full Stanford course, including all the tests and everything else. Mm -hmm. And the number one Stanford student scored number 413 in the class. And that was the, and, and like, this wasn't just like the top engineering school students of the world. This was people like, you know, stay at home moms in Pakistan. Like it was people all over the world that were, you know, super smart, but just like in all kinds of different situations. And that's the epiphany moment that like, you don't have to be a Stanford grad to understand AI or to be successful at AI. Uh, and that, that really kicked off the company. Now, if you for fast forward to today, we're very different now, right? So we start off as a MOOC, we're no longer MOOC, we're, we're much more of a, you know, a, a career upskilling platform, um, project-based learning. Uh, we've had over 10 million uh, learners on our platform across 160 countries. We've graduated 100,000 nano degree students and think of a nano degree as like a fully functioning machine engineer, a fully functioning um, self-driving car engineer. Um, we have uh, 100 enterprise clients, 60% of them are in the Fortune 500 or Global 2000. Uh, and the product market fit on the enterprise is just crazy. So we, you know, around uh, 2015, we had nano degree graduates, you know, across most of the Fortune 500, as these giant companies with hundreds of thousand employees realized that they needed to go through digital transformation, they, as the data shows in the previous slides, they realized they didn't have the skill sets to do that. They couldn't hire the skill sets to do that. And then our nanodegree graduates raised their hands and said, hey, listen, why don't you go to Udacity instead of buying one nanodegree at a time, buy a thousand at a time. So you can you know, train a thousand or 2000 or 5,000 or however many you want at the same time. And they came to us and that, uh, and that really started our entire enterprise program. And now, and now that is, is our largest uh, business uh, and it grew 122% last year. Um, we also work with five governments around the world and, and that business is expanding. It'll grow 100% this year. 
uh, where we're par uh, partnering with government agencies to um, develop custom programs to reskill their populations, mm. right? So, you know, for example, like we're working with Egypt and they want to develop a technology outsourcing center the way India did. And uh, they don't have the capability of the university to do that. And so they're, they're going to us and that's what we're doing for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, you know, billion dollar valuation, uh, last funding round. Mm -hmm. That's what does all come. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Just a, yeah, just a quick question. Uh, when we had the, the previous slide there, when you look at the current, current uh, context, uh, so super interesting. The, the underlying theme, so to speak, uh, in, 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 in the go live event so far been rising to the challenge. And, and I think the way that you kind of, you know, paint the background around the, 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 the market and, you know, what we're going through today is, is, is obviously a very challenging one, both for the individual, right. But also from, from an organizational point of view, from a market point of view, it, uh, we find obviously there are a tremendously exciting opportunities that that hide maybe underneath these challenges. Uh, what do you see as, you know, what's different to today? Uh, have you seen any, any uh, uh, changes in demand or what, what organizations or businesses or individuals are, are looking for or, or asking for in this current context, so to speak? Yeah, it's really interesting. So historically what happens uh, in the, you know, upskilling market. And there, there, there really was no, you'd ask you anyone like us the last recession, right? And so we didn't know exactly what was gonna happen. We, we kind of anticipated consumer demand would go up because people go back to university during uh, recessionary periods. Uh, we have seen that for sure, big upticks in consumer demand. Um, on the enterprise side, it was unclear because historically enterprises mm -hmm. had cut uh, learning mm -hmm. and development budgets. Uh, what you would has done, which is quite different it, uh, than others, is we typically don't attach to um, kind of general education as a benefit. Um, and we, we really attach to mission critical business transformation. So we tend to partner with CIOs, CTOs, chief digital op officers, the people who are driving digital transformation in businesses. So think if you're right. a CTO and you're driving a $2 billion migration to Microsoft Azure, uh, and mm -hmm. you don't have, and you need to train like thousands of people on, on Azure and you don't have those, that, that training, like that's mm -hmm. what we do. Right. So that's mission critical. And so the net result is we haven't, like, we, we thought there would be a pullback in the enterprise market. If anything, we're seeing it accelerate. And, uh, it's because we're really, uh, digital transformation initiatives are, uh, mm -hmm. are accelerating and, okay. you know, enterprises so are realizing they need to, to automate and to, um, and to transform. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, we're coming close to the top of the hour, so I let you finish that uh, you know final slide, and then we'll conclude together yeah. also with Didri. I'll just take two seconds here, and, and it kind of links to what I, I was just saying, which is you know you'd ask these focus on like business outcomes. So it's not just like well you know let's have a, a benefit for someone who may maybe wants to learn something. It's like how do you need to transform your business, and how do you get a positive outcome? We partner with Airbus, um, which is a very very. Uh, you know, important and great partner of ours to uh, help them create a digital academy uh, for transformation. And some of the outcomes from our students, we've had thousands of people go through, um, you know, nano degrees with them. Um, you know, our, our graduates have, you know, developed uh, modeling and machine learning algor algorithms that have reduced airline de delays for one of their Latin American uh, airline partners by 10%, $13 million a year in cost savings for a, a U.S. carrier. Um, and reduction in, you know, reporting times from three weeks to one day for another carrier. And so like the outcomes of this, it's not just like, how can I upskill someone cheaply? It's like, what are the positive business outcomes and right. interventions you can get from these going? So that's it. I'll, I'll shut up and thank you. Thank you guys for listening. Well, thank you, Gabe. These are awesome, um, insights and, and I think that, uh, the, the, um, the topic future work um you know really has to evolve around how do we understand I mean, how do we understand you know the, the the new capabilities new proficiencies we need to pick up we need to learn i mean obviously not just from a covid 19 perspective but also from from you know the whole macro trend around ai and automation and all of that so that's that's uh, super interesting um Deirdre, what's your reflection on gabe's um nuances here and his views and position here. I think by, 
My reaction is, is just hopefulness, mm. to be honest. I love the idea that investing in the people they have, mm. skill them, forward skill them, tune in them, and actually look. You're breaking up a little bit. Where the needs obviously. Right. Yeah. With invest in meet. So I think it's fabulous. Yeah. No, I fully agree. You're a little bit uh, choppy here, but uh, I picked up like the the encouraging views that you that you expressed, right? That there are tremendous opportunities that we see uh, in, um, uh, you know, before us also in terms of upskilling and learning new things and applying applying that uh, for for you know further acceleration and actually growth moving forward. Um, we need employers Gabe, to invest. Do you have any? Yeah, we need exactly, exactly. There, there. It's, it's you know, absolutely that uh, that need. Gabe, do you have any um, final uh, thoughts, remarks uh, that you want to share uh, in the context of rising to the challenge and future of work? Yeah, look, I I think it's um, as to, to go to Deidre's you know perspective on how you work and like how you drive uh, alignment through your organization. I'd suggest uh. First of all, sign up for her platform, and second of all, make one of your OKRs uh, upskilling and transforming your workforce. <laughs> um, but uh, but but really, you know, truly, uh, we have big big challenges ahead of us. Um, you know, the jobs of the future are, are are very different from the jobs of the past. People are going through real pain, um, and we all need to learn how to how to how to work differently. Um, so I think. Um, I think this is the time to invest in your technology. This is the time to invest in your, uh, in your platform. This is the time to invest in your people and make sure you're setting yourself up. Cause I promise you, like what you see in economic recessions is innovation and, and most disruptive companies are formed, I think in, in recessions, like the next competitor who's going to disrupt your industry is starting right now. Right. And you need to be ahead of that and, and shut that off through your own innovation. And, and, you know, you can't do that without, without the right objectives and the right people. Yeah. No, I fully agree. And one of the comments from the attendees is, uh, it's a thank you note to you, Didri and Gabe, and uh, summarizing the key learnings, uh, quote, uh, our effective use of OKR and tracking OKR improve collaboration and continuous learning. That's the key takeaways. And we are on top of the hour. Um, thank you so much, Gabe and Didri for joining us. Rising to the challenge. Um, Future work um, will be the next theme also um, on May 29th, um, where we will be joined by Asana and Tandem. And um, on June 2nd, we will be joined by the product manager from Microsoft, for Microsoft Teams, Zagula Mohammed and Risto Lechtis Meki from IDN, uh, the design agency, also EVP and Capgemini. Um, while there is tremendous pressure in the market and uh, organizations are obviously struggling, um, there are also um, opportunities. And there are also, um, I would like to then extend what you said, Didri, the encouraging views on what's actually uh, is now a, like we are catalyst into something new, right? Future of work, uh, we're not, not turning back to the way things were, we're heading into a new future and um, future of work is a tremendously relevant and important uh, topic moving forward. So to all of you attendees, thank you for joining us uh, today and I look forward to engaging uh, with you on May 29th and on June 2nd. Gabe Didri, thank you so much. Thank you.